Welcome to the Scariest Things Podcast, your gateway to the trends and tropes of the horror genre. This is episode 184, Gothic Horror. <laughs> this is going back to the origins of uh, the horror medium, and uh, I am your host, Eric Lee, and I am joined in Portland by... Mike Campbell. And from New Orleans with... Liz Williams. So this is... Um, this was a... a, a Request from Sharon Yeblon, one of our uh, Patreon um, uh, contributors, and you know this is it. It, it's, it was harder than I thought it was going to be. I think that there that there is, you know, when you when you get past because when you think of Gothic horror, you think of something that was from the 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 nineteenth century, um, and that it was, um, you know, Shelley and Stoker and Bronte and Poe and all these yeah. all these great literary names and then they get translated to the screen and in the 1930s and 1940s you get a lot of these movies and they kind of hang on and then they become period piece movies later on in the 70s 80s and and beyond but it's it becomes a bit of what makes it what makes it gothic beyond like you know uh poofy skirts and and fog on the moors right what what right. what what, what, well, what the, makes it gothic the origins go back even to the like even back further like is it i think what you're leaning into is the victorian age the the origins go back to the germanic culture from like the 6th century yeah it's so like way the hell back visigoths like the visigoths yeah way 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 back uh but yeah uh i think i think in terms of in terms of literature, in terms of film, I think you're going to see a lot of this stuff leaning into the Victorian age right. for uh, some pretty clear reasons because I think most of the characteristics around goths involve castles, religious buildings, monasteries, covenants, mm -hmm. convents, uh, crypts. Uh, the atmosphere is very, you know, claustrophobic, spooky, spooky, mm -hmm. very dark. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the thing that really threw me was that much, much like my my beloved Giallo, I think the gothic story is usually like sort of discontinuous. It's like really convoluted. <laughs> they don't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, they yeah. they involve oftentimes. Sort yep. of tales within tales, yes. Like changing narrators, which I was like, "What the hell?" Uh, that, that that is so true. And actually, there's a there's a book that I listened to uh -huh. last year, The Fisherman, uh -huh. which has often described mm -hmm. as a gothic tale, which okay. has a big story yeah. within another big story, where you, all of a sudden you're away from your main storyline for half the book, mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. comes back to it, and it's like, yep. but that that is a gothic tradition, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And the other thing I think that happens a lot is there's uh, these movies tend to be heavy on exposition. Yeah, that they that they will tell these crazy stories, but they will tell it right and not necessarily show it. So there's a lot right. of there's a lot of yes. like pouring of wine and discussing the, the, the <laughs> curse or the or the 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 history of the. Totally. You know, the, 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 the or they pour the wine and, and then tell you the tale. Yes, and that is <laughs> that is that can be a drag, <laughs> straight up. Um, you know, and I think that they, they they like to bring in some of these ethereal and and, and the, but there's narratives. The, these movies often, like like the haunting, is yeah. a great is a great one. The, the, mm -hmm. And I love that Shirley Jackson book. Right. I love the haunting, the movie. Yep. But, but it uh, it's it is a slow burner, and it starts off with a long introduction. Right. Which is brilliant, but yeah. at the same time, it's a big exposition narrative dump about the history of why this house is haunted. Yep. And I think a lot of haunted haunted house movies fall into this this kind of a the, uh, in, into the gothic yeah uh tradition and you know i think that that it it sometimes it makes it it can bog a film down sure on the plus side you get you get ruins mm -hmm. you get death like states yeah. you get live burials and you get evil doubles or twins yeah those are all very ah, interesting yeah. super duper heavy goth things and those are all kind of cool <laughs> uh, the thing, the things that aren't cool is when you get the the weird, convoluted, you know, family histories, which a lot of these goth films do. Like that's where you get this exposition, which mm -hmm. you know, this person begat that person yeah. who begat this who begat, and you're just like you get so mm -hmm. lost mm -hmm. so fast. Yeah, and and I think that, well, one of the things that I heard described about Anne Rice, mm -hmm. who 
famously took up the Southern Gothic. Yeah, Southern mm-hmm. Gothic, mm-hmm. picking up picking up the torch. And one of the things that set her apart was that she was very, very descriptive in so the atmospherics in a way that say H.P. Lovecraft also would use a lot of language and and would would describe a scene or mm-hmm. the or the emotional states of the characters in in very flowery and extensive ways and and in a in an era where you're kind of wanting the bang 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 let's get through the movie let's get through the you know that that that, that some of these things take their time mm-hmm. and it's harder to do that in a movie than it is in a book because in a book right. you're kind of invested in some of these things and you can mm-hmm. appreciate what the what the characters are seeing and and thinking and you know short of voiceovers yeah. and narratives right which you which sometimes they get. do have voiceovers yes. and narratives a lot and the the, yep. the, the thunder is rumbling above yep. the castle on a it was a dark and stormy like, night yeah, yeah it was yeah. a dark and stormy night yeah. liz where are you at with gothic well, li- literature film and uh music gothic music i'm here for it definitely <laughs> When I wasn't listening to hair metal, it was I was listening to goth. Unfortunately, I couldn't just do uh, movies about goths. Yeah. I don't like classic gothic horror. I uh-uh. do not like you know Crimson Peak and Dracula and stuff like that. I was raised in the South, and so I was steeped in Southern Gothic and took classes on Eudora Welty and Faulkner mm-hmm. and all these things, and could talk about Eve's Bayou and Angel Heart all day long. So I found a nice definition of gothic horror, which is that gothic stories always borrow from the region's history and landscape to create a sense of isolation, uneasiness, and fear that Mm -hmm. comes from Hannah Ali and uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. WBRU in Boston. And I, all mine, focus on Midwestern gothic, which is a super aesthetic trope. Okay. uh, Midwestern gothic. Their their key phrases are endless fields stretching out to the horizon, location-based alienation, Strange sounds and lights coming from the woods, oh. harsh winters, tiny towns where everyone knows everybody else's business, churches with blazing lights proclaiming the end of the world, bodies buried in the backyard, and the never-ending <laughs> feeling that something is very wrong. And you, for- oh, yeah. you forgot uh, casseroles and beer. Hot dish. <laughs> and hot, yeah, hot, hot, hot dish, dish. Hot dish hot and beer. Dish. <laughs> yep. Overalls. Wisconsin is yeah. totally there. But <laughs> when I talk about my films, you will be able to picture yourself in the Midwestern Gothic aesthetic. There's yep. also Gothic aesthetics. There's Outback Gothic and Aussie Gothic, which is takes just place in the actual Outback, right. and they have theirs. There's yeah. more mm-hmm. Southern. There's Southwestern, like Desert Gothic. Yeah. Um, because really anywhere you have a desolate landscape and the creepy people of the town making you right. feel weird when you're an outsider, you have your yeah. elements of so gothic. children of the corn. Oh, I'll talk about it. Oh, oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. 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 yeah, that's that's well, a, that's Midwest you know, Gothic right it, there. It's mm-hmm. not not on my list, though I probably now that I think about it, now that you described it that way, I would very much put the wind. As, as an American Gothic tale. Depends Western. on what state it took place in. It would be Western Gothic. It's, yeah, probably. Western Gothic, because yeah. I think it's Colorado is where the is where Yes, that, takes that goes place to the West. Now, I thought we yeah. put that in the folk horror category. Didn't we put that in the folk horror category? It is both. I mean, okay. it's, it's, it's both. They can be both. They can Double totally dipping. go both. Yeah. Double dipping. Folk horror, I think there's a ways. lot of folk horror kind of ties to, to some some of these, these Gothic elements, particularly once you get away from. Uh, like cities and stuff like yeah. that. So uh, the, 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 just the nature well, of the I, spiritual I think, stuff. I think the I think the, the one of the big delineating points between Gothic horror and folk horror is the use of castles and religious buildings and monasteries and crypts and mm-hmm. co- convents and that that kind of thing. That where you don't Religion, you, you yeah. don't get as much of that in folk horror. Yeah. Folk horror is more well, sort of um, leaning towards you know the environment and you know pagan uh, idolatry. Uh, uh, yeah, pagan idolatry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and like here, you know, classic American Gothic, that would kind of be with Midwestern Gothic, you can get a painting. We also have Northeastern, which is um, all like Legacy of Salem Witch Trials. So yeah. Oh, yeah, there's yeah, yeah. so For much sure. like New England Gothic. And I you think could go crazy on I that. I think Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft mm-hmm. yep. fall into that category of also being very wordy. Yeah. Thoughtful, yes. right, right. Uh, you know, New England based, yeah, dark, mm-hmm. drippy. I mean, it's that, but you know, I think that they created the term cosmic horror to attach to Lovecraft to differentiate him, him from the the gothic style. But his trappings of of being very verbose and descriptive 
falls into that yeah that tradition so all right let's start with uh casserole hot dish casserole hot dish yeah you want what? me to start sure all right so i'm gonna go I, my three choices <laughs> i'm gonna go with in the order in which they were released and okay my first one is also a gateway because i'm Ooh. picking the 1983 film something wicked this way comes nice. oh, which is yeah. a walt disney production I it is know. not quite as scary for kids as the watcher in the woods but Kids these days will be like, what is this garbage? But kids who are our age will probably be like, oh, it's a little freaky. I like yeah. it. Um, this is, of course, uh, based on the Ray Bribery novel of the same name. It stars Jason Robard, Jonathan Price, Diane Ladd, and Pam Greer. Yeah. Um, while it was filmed in Vermont, it takes place in the town of Greentown, Illinois. And what do you need to have Midwestern Gothic? You need crops and agriculture. And here we've got pumpkins. Yep. And in the fields of pumpkins, <laughs> an autumn carnival just magically appears. And don't get on that carousel because this carnival is not what it seems. It has Jonathan Price as Mr. Dark and his pandemonium car uh, carnival that is taking kind of a careful what you wish for uh, trope and all the elder people who get on these rides are being turning turned younger and he's stealing their souls and the kids who just want to grow up are thinking this is their ticket to be adults and finally be listened to but it's the power of love that defeats the devil because that's what it is it's the devil's carnival mm -hmm. the end. I yeah. no, I that's a great pick because I think that it has it has this sort of sense of mystery about it, yep. and it's, yeah. uh, it's like sort of this this kind of a dread. But it is not an action. It's not a really. Uh, it's not an. It's, it's not, not an really active action. Movie. Um, it definitely has a lot. There is a scene. So also, if you want to see this, go to your local library and get this baby on DVD. Yeah. You cannot stream this anywhere except for a horrible, horrible, horrible copy on YouTube. So I and, went down to the and, library. And, 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 Liz, this last year they put this out. Uh, they did a 4K restoration restoration yeah. of it, and it looks incredible. I wonder, you know what? Uh, it would be I interesting to see the if they put it on the Disney the Channel. Library. Yeah. Because, I mean, you would that, that's what they should. I don't think right. that they did, because when I looked for streaming, it didn't say unless disney wants me to pay to even find out if it's there which yeah. i won't do yeah. <laughs> disney because i go to the library but yeah. i you know i got a blu-ray copy yeah. it was a nice copy mm -hmm. but there's a whole scene where the carnies are looking for these two little boys who are on to them and they create this creepy ass parade down the center of the town yeah. and that's when you're seeing like some of the adults who have now been transformed into children it is creepy so mm -hmm. i think for midwestern gothic it's all about vibes and atmosphere the yeah. wind is blowing the fall is coming it's autumnal it is something is not right mm -hmm. and that these are my kind of favorite things mm -hmm. the, the so, edge yeah. the end of summer the beginning of autumn and just something's not right yeah and this is a good one. Yeah. I think atmospheric, very atmospheric. It's super atmospheric. And I think it holds up as a really nice production. Um, the special effects are terrible because it was from 1983, mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. still manages to be pretty darn creepy. You we, know, and the, the other thing that's really great about it too, is the, the fact that this was like at the tail end of Disney doing like studio production stuff. Mm -hmm. And as all theaters or as all production companies started to move, more into um, kind of like actual like on location sets. This has got a mix of the two, which creates this weird sort of dreamlike state where there's like certain scenes throughout the film where you're like, well, this is clearly on a set. This is on a Hollywood right. set, but then they'll cut away to the next scene, which is clearly on location, yep. which that, that sort of um, that bifurcation as they whip back and forth There's between those word. two things is creates a really weird dreamy kind of quality. And that's what I, mm -hmm. that was one of the things I well, remember really, uh, loving about uh, when I rewatched when I rewatched the 4K restoration of it, it really it stands out mightily. Well, when we mm -hmm. talked about circus horror, uh, mm -hmm. when when the the carnival comes to town, yeah, um, I think that is that is the, that that kind of dreamy element relative to you know the the, the arrival of all these outrageous kinds of things at, at a time when you know the circus was 
your 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 thrill ride, your yeah. your your, your right. movie, your your that that was their your entertainment. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, uh, Cirque du Soleil still still amazes, but you're not getting. They've taken the scary out of it. Yeah, yeah, except yeah. For, yeah. Except for the you know the acrobats who are doing death defying things, but it's not. It doesn't have that spooky funhouse kind of stuff. Right. So yeah, and this one yeah. deals with you know yeah. the townspeople's fear of getting old, the little boy's yeah. fear of no one's listening to me because I'm little. It taps into yeah. all the human emotions. Lots and that's of tropes. The trope point. Filled. Lots of tropes. It is yep. trope. Yep. It's the trope carnival come yep. to town. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but it's good. The first gothic film i have has got it's got it all okay it's got all oh. the got it's got tombs okay it's got castles oh it's got fog oh it's got ghosts okay uh it's got more candles uh it's got a Fine. i'm wondering if we might have the same movie but keep going super convoluted story <laughs> okay, yeah. super duper convoluted story this is the 1966 italian gothic horror film directed by Mario Bava, oh, we pick the kill same one. baby, kill. We did not pick the same movie. Kill baby, kill. Uh, not the fact be- that you think, after hearing all of that, including the director, that it's the same movie, just means that all those gothic movies are the same. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, you just yeah. wait. You yeah, just yeah, wait. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not to, uh, this is kill baby kill. Not of course not to be confused with uh, baby kill baby kill. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't know if it exists, but there should be. <laughs> Uh, so this is this involves a, a Carpathian village, which is sort of re- reeks of reeks of reeks of Gothic. Yeah, uh, it's haunted by the ghost of a, a murderous little girl and a um, uh, the a uh, the, the, a murder takes place, prompting a coroner and a medical student to uncover the little girl's secrets. At the same time. There is a witch in the village who is attempting to protect the villagers. And so the question becomes, is the witch really good? Is the witch really bad? What is the witch's connection to the little girl? What is the coroner and the medical student who are, you know, perfectly perfect and perfectly beautiful uh, Italians sure. from the mid-1960s? <laughs> what is their connection uh, to the little girl? Uh, all these things and more are answered in, again, a hyper-convoluted story that I won't bore people with because it is <laughs> hyper-convoluted. But, man, out of all the films I watched, I would say this is probably the best looking. And I think we've talked about this in the past, you know, in, in, uh, and leaning into Eric's expertise in architecture. The thing that, you know, so many of these uh, European countries are benefit from is these castles and ruins and everything else that you just don't have in the United States. Um, they've got this in spades and they lean into all of this. That said, uh, the film was um, a very, very troubled production. It, uh, the film ran out of money <laughs> during principal photography, prompting the cast and crew of the film to finish the film without the knowledge that they wouldn't be paid for their work. Uh-oh. <laughs> and then in post production, uh, they didn't even have enough money for a real soundtrack, and they hadn't budgeted for a soundtrack, so they basically had to use stock move stock music that Bava had used for prior films. So if you've seen any of his prior films, you'll think to yourself, "Wait a second, uh, this sounds." <laughs> <laughs> well, it might be taken right from the movie that I'm going to be describing. Right, right. Yeah, because Bullshit. he because <laughs> because Mario Bava had of course done Black Sabbath, he did The Whip and the Body in 1963. So if you've seen those films, a lot of these a lot of these sounds you might be hearing again. The thing that's funny was that because it was such a troubled production and because the finances were so uh, topsy turvy with Kill Baby Kill, Apparently, allegedly, uh, Mario Bava, who's of course no longer with us, claimed at a later date that uh, the whole film was it w- really wasn't his fault, and he, he made it uh, on a uh, on uh, as as a result of a dare, uh, a, a bet with. I'm sure um, that went over well with the actors and actresses yeah, who didn't get paid with um, <laughs> with Americans. So not only did he say the whole film was a dare, he blamed it on. Like quote course. quote unnamed Americans. Did he say he, unnamed dirty fat Americans? <laughs> I mean, come on. Some unnamed Americans <laughs> <Yeah>. showed up. <laughs> but uh, it is 
man, it's a great looking film. So it is such a great looking film. The dubbing gets a little, you know, it does get a little tedious. That's with all Italian horror movies. That's all Italian horror films. But man, it's a good looking film. And it is, if you stick with it, kind of an interesting story. This is a film, uh, when, of course, we just talked about remakes. Uh, this is a film that could easily be remade into probably a pretty darn scary film by 2024 standards. Eric, what do you got? Well, I'm going to go with the 1960 uh, oh. Italian horror movie uh -oh. that has crypts yeah. and candles and a castle Ghosts? and fog Ghosts? and a hill. <laughs> Uh, no, but oh. it has a witch. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, coffins. Okay. And, uh, this was, I think, brought upon by, and this is also directed by Mario Bava. Yeah. This is Black Sunday. Yeah. So this is, this one, th this is easy to get into because right from the get-go, you get the yeah. execution of, uh, of uh, Asa Vajja, who is uh, played by the gorgeous Barbara Steele, who has the most... Marvelous eyes of any actress in the history of Hollywood, um, and uh, she gets thrown into an uh, into an Iron Maiden and crushed. In and this is 1960. It this this was only that at this time it was so violent. This was part of the the changing of uh, you know they don't have to worry about the Hayes Code because it's Italian. Right, 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 and, right. And, and, and so yeah, so that they. You know, they they slam the door on her and just punch her full of holes and she bleeds out to the bottom and her paramour. Um, and then uh, this was so that was in the um, the 1630s, and then a couple hundred years later, you get the professor and his and his apprentice, and they're rolling through Moldo uh, uh, Moldova, I mm -hmm. believe, because it's always like mm -hmm. Romania yeah. or Hungary or you know these uh, spooky Eastern, Eastern European. European countries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And apparently, the Italians find uh, you know Moldova spooky too. So yep, uh, but. Mm -hmm. They run into a woman who just who's the descendant of Asavaja, whose yep. name's Katya, Katya Vaja. So it gets a little confusing, um, <laughs> uh, but she shows up and and she shows up with these two enormous mastiffs, right? So there's a classic picture, one of the great pictures from the era, where it shows her, you know, with the 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 cat, this castle ruin, and these two gigantic dogs, and then. And and the young the young assistant falls immediately in love with Katya, uh, but there's a curse going on, and then eventually because they they're bumbling around in the crypt, because their they're, 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 their carriage is broken down, so they take shelter in a crypt, and they knock the, the lid open, and it releases the spirit of Asavaja, who starts taking vengeance upon the descendants of all those who wronged her, and uh, again convoluted kind of kind of story. Plenty of weird exposition from the professor. So there you go. There's your gothic stuff. Um, but it is, uh, it's my favorite of the, ba uh, of, of the Bava films. I think it, it is, <laughs> it's, um, and it just, and again, it's beautiful black and white and it looks like it was, he took a lot of influence from the universal horror movie. So he has those big, the big sets, the tall, tall sets. And I think, I think even if, if I'm recalling correctly, I think there's even a marriage at stake, which is a classic, sure, sure. classic yeah, yeah, yeah. universal yeah. monster movie thing. All those 1930s movies were on the backdrop of "We're going to get married, and this monster is yeah. going to ruin everything." <laughs> so, um, the, but you know, it's interesting. The and when we did the top 100 mm -hmm. in 2018, mm -hmm. we looked at the top 100 films of all time. This was in the, this the was Black Sunday was like 99. It was like it was it was, it was yeah it was somewhere between 90 and 100. When we redid the top, and I don't know if this is the biggest bounce. Yeah. That we had, but when we redid the top uh, 100 in 2022, this this dropped 204. Yeah, that's a big drop. It, wow, yeah, that was it, big it, drop. Some, somebody somebody had it on their top 25 and decided not to include it, yeah. so it felt like a rock. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that it's not a good movie. Um, no, I think it's I think it belongs uh, it, more closer to 100 yeah. than it does 200. Yeah, and I think what what, what was happening was this is right. This is not too long after they did the horror of Dracula with Christopher Lee and Hammer, mm -hmm. and all of those those Hammer reboots, and the Italians went, "Hey, yeah, cheap, you know, got it's like their people are paying to see these things, and we can go more violent than our American counterparts," and and so they did, and um, there's there's this great the the great fight at the end in the crypt with the 
with just like a witch, witchy vampire kind of. Uh-huh. It's just it is, it's it. When when you think of some some sixties, you know the 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 classic sixties horror movies, a lot of them are very thinky and they're not a lot of fun. Right. This one's fun. Yeah. So anyway, so that's that's uh, uh, and or particularly for gothic horror, I thought it's like yeah, yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so, I think mm-hmm. I think it fits. Swinging back to Liz. We're going back into the cornfields because this is Children of the Corn. Okay. Yeah. Are set in the fictional town of Yatlin, Nebraska. Uh, this time, the crops aren't working, so we got to sacrifice something to he who walks behind the rose in the corn. This, of course, stars Peter Horton of 30-something fame, mm-hmm. Linda Hamilton, from Terminator, Courtney Gaines, and John Franklin. Uh, Courtney Gaines as Malachi is probably the most recognizable character from this because if you see any clips, you just see him yelling Outlander. And he is just <laughs> one of the nicest people I've ever met. So I got to meet him up at the Portland. I can't remember if he was there for Portland Horror or for what? HP Lovecraft. You really? He but, was uh, there? Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. He was there. Super wow. nice man. So I feel like everybody knows the story of Children of the Corn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. have seen at least one of the probably, mm, shit, like nine uh, movies that they have. Uh, but, I think with the one that came out last year, I think they're at, I want to say 10 or 11. Maybe, yeah, there, maybe, there's a maybe lot. 12. Maybe 12. There's a lot. Yeah. But the original from yep. 1984 deserves to be seen. It is such a great movie. It's Stephen King, of course, but it's yep. not set in Maine. Yep. And it's, you know, you got your corn, you got your crazy religion, you got your cults, you got your fear, you got your isolation, and you got adults being killed by tiny children that just want the crops to come back, as children do when you're in a gothic Midwestern. And you got uh, Isaac's silly little hat and suit, so you've got, you know, he looks like a creepy preacher. It, it Vibes, vibes, vibes. It fits every one of the criteria. So, Liz, do you think that there was justification to have as many sequels as we got from Children Absolutely of the Corn? Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you needed any sequels. No, uh, it's... It, it, so we could it go is, back to our prior episode and say, what's the movie that should have everything taken yeah, away from right. it? Because I think, yeah. cause how, like, how many of... Because uh, Mike, we, we, Mike dedicated himself to actually trying to watch as many of these as he could. I was close. I was close. Uh, I, I want to say it's like 10... I, I think it's like 10 or 11 is where we're at were now. They, were they as actually a, sequels? Because the, the, the most, the seven, one that they just eight, did was a reboot. Right. Nine, right. ten. There's 11 total, right. including the remake. Yep. And the reboot. Right. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. Boy, that that reboot is so stinky bad. Yeah. 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 And the the one that just came out. It, it, yeah. It was. Shame just, on just, you, Shudder. Shame just the, on you. Just the, <laughs> it the, was the, so bad. the writing was bad. The acting was bad. The premise, it's like, and, and then they had the corn monster. It was just like, this yeah. is not, this is not the way to do Children of the Corn. Because this is, now, because uh, was this Stephen King associated? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Yes, 100%. He, he wrote a story based yeah. on a short story that he wrote in the 70s. Yep. I have so. not read the story. Mike, have you read the story? I have read the story. Yeah. Would well, you know where it was first published? That I don't know. In the old know. March 1977 issue of Penthouse, baby. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. What, you didn't have that copy? I, I, <laughs> no. I told you. Yes, I that's again. right. I got it for yeah. the articles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. for the articles. I'm that's missing right. March. That's, right. that's the one I'm missing. <laughs> but uh, then it was uh, part of his um, Night Shift collection. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the yeah. One Children of the Corn remake. Uh, or, or sequel that wasn't too terrible was Children of the Corn Three: Urban Harvest, where they go to Chicago. That one's not. That and one's go, not, and, and and was it was it uh, in the grocery store? Right? <laughs> it's like, all right, so we're just gonna we're just gonna shelve some more boxes of corn, and we're gonna. That one's yeah, not bad. Gonna, it's not bad. It's not bad. Okay. Oh, and thanks to Wikipedia linking everything through, where I can look up Stephen King. This is also the town. Where his novella and then the Netflix film 1922 are set. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, that yeah. would also fit yep. our Midwestern gothic. Yep. There you go. Uh, but it wasn't that great of a film. But there you go. Yep. That's it. Children of the Corn. 
All right. The original only. Uh, the next gor- uh, gothic horror film that I slogged through, uh, and thankfully it was short, <laughs> was The Mask of the Red Death. Oh, so you're really going with the classic. Mm, you truly are going with the classic classics. gothic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a 1964, uh, predating the uh, Mario Bava film by two years. Uh, 1964 horror film directed by Roger Corman, starring the Vincent Price. And a whole bunch of nobodies. Uh, this, of course, is based on the Edgar Allan Poe uh, story of the same name um, that follows a prince who is terrorizing a plague-ridden peasantry while merrymaking in a lonely castle with his jaded courtiers. Oh, my uh, goodness. That's yeah. the most gothic thing I've ever heard. I know. I know. <laughs> um, it is. It's uh, the thing. Here's the thing that's incredible about this film, and I did not know this until I had watched it and started to research it. But uh, the film was one of the very, very first films ever shot by cinematographer uh, Nicholas Re- Rogue. Oh, wow. who of course did Don't Look Now. Yeah, so mm-hmm. I did not know that he had any anything at all to do with uh, the Roger Corman. Um, uh, the, the Roger Corman uh, school of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Roger Corman, yeah, he he launched a thousand careers. Right, right. This was not as successful as a lot of the other uh, Poe films that Roger Corman had had done. And in fact, Sam Sam Arkoff, uh, who was a longtime contributor with um, uh, Roger Corman, said that it was too arty farty. <laughs> and Sam, and Samuel now, Arkoff, who I think gave us Attack of the Fifty Foot Woman, right? yeah. So that was like, okay, well, yeah. He said it was too arty farty, not scary enough. And then eventually, later on in life, Roger Corman said, "Yeah, I think that's pretty legitimate." But but what, now, Mike, what did you see in it like, compared to well, the other Poe po films that that? Oh, again, much in the same way that, uh, much in the same way that. Uh, that uh, Mario Bava did Kill Baby Kill. Uh, really great sets, really great costumes, really great. And this one, of course, has a whole color theme to it with uh, the Red Death. And um, it is a pretty astonishing tale that does lean a little bit into Satanism. And, and Roger Corman really tried to draw that out because the Edgar Allan Poe story doesn't get really deep into that, but Roger Corman starts to draw out that sort of satanic element that the the prince uh, Vincent he, Price he was dabbling to, in. He's got to sexy it up a little. Yeah, you got to sexy it up. You got to try to try to make it sort of scary. But I think that was the thing that really drew, drew me to it was that it does. It is a good looking film. Uh, great again, great sets. The great Vincent Price. It's just. To Sam Arkoff's point, it's not really scary. Mm-hmm. It's not a terribly scary film, but it is a pretty darn good looking film. I was I was this close, and for yeah. those of you, since we're not here, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyways, like, <laughs> I'm my that close, like about a half an inch apart um, from from actually putting the whole Mike Flanagan. Oh yeah, there you go. Fall House mm-hmm. of Usher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As as, as this, I, I I thought it might be a little bit too much on the nose, and it's been very very popular for good reason. Yeah. Um, it's got me. It's it weirdly, you watch it and you go, I think I'm gonna go read some Poe. Yeah. Um. And, yeah. And and it, it that, you know, that the interpretations in the of, you know, the Mask of the Red Death was a house, it was a rave party. Right. I think in in basically uh, yeah in this and. Um, you know, and you get to see you know see all those tales woven together, and then the through lines, and I thought it was just brilliant, and I loved, loved Bruce Green, Bruce Greenwood doing oh, Roderick so Usher, and yeah. and the closing when he's actually reading the Raven. Yeah, I got chills. It was yeah, one of those yeah, things yeah. where it was like that is so that's a, such a great way to close it, and they didn't even tell you like you look at, because when when you read the. The, the stories that they, they talk about, it's like, okay, it's the pit and the pendulum. Yeah. And then the last one, it's like, well, they're going to save the raven for last because it's the most famous. But they also did, it's like, where's Cask of Amontillado? Right, right, and right. they did it mm-hmm. in the last one. Yep. And it was yeah. like, oh, God, that was so perfect. And it was that, I, I, I tell you, that is that is some some a great modern adaptation of some of, 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 a, of gothic stories without it making it feel kind of, I mean, there's a ton of exposition in there because there's all these connections of the kids and what their backstory is but they do it by by showing not telling yeah and you're never bored oh, by God, the exposition no, you're so riveted yep. yeah that's 
Just a testament to those actors yeah. and to Mike Flanagan. Anybody who shies away from Fall of the House of Usher thinking that it's going to be like a school project, you're you're wrong. It yep. is so yeah. entertaining. It is it's it's breathtaking. I I think it's one of the best things from horror from last year. I I was late to the oh, party. 100%. I didn't I didn't I didn't see it until this year, and so I it didn't get on my top top ten list. But it right. would have been on my top ten list. Had well, I seen and it. you know the the crazy thing is too, like much with like Mask of the Red Death, the fact that Roger Corman was able to pull so much out of it, and the fact that Mike Flanagan was able right. to pull so much out of it. Mask of the Red Death is ten pages long. Yeah, <laughs> right. It is oh, literally ten not- pages long, yeah. which I'm sure there's some authors kicking around today in 2024 that should probably learn that lesson that there is such a thing brevity. as <laughs> word economy and yeah. and brevity. Yeah, I, <laughs> that's I, a real thing. I think what Corman also managed to do with all of his uh, productions was give. I think he learned from Hammer. I'm going to bring some awesome looking sets and costumes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and 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 to to bolster his stories with a great look. Yeah. And that, yeah, yeah, and and that by the time the seventies hit, like the fifties, he didn't have the money and he couldn't do it. Yeah, like things like it came like a, it conquered the world where they just it looked silly. And by the time the seventies hit and he's doing like biker gang yeah. kind of stuff, in the sixties he was throwing decent money to do impressive sets and yeah. I, and and a lot of it was the post stuff. Yep. So, all right, where are we at? Who's next? Uh, you are. Oh, I am. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've got a a, a a fairly recent movie. Which is a no doubt about it, uh, gothic horror. Ooh. Uh, and we have Foggy Moors, and we have a lycanthrope, and we've got what? it's a, it's it's a European, um, it's a, like a Norman farmstead. It's the cursed, uh, and it's oh. like this is one of those things. I've heard like, about this, but I haven't this is, seen it. It's great. This I was this was a recommendation from Joseph, and I watched it, and it mm-hmm. it landed on my top ten list from twenty twenty one. What? Uh, and it's directed by Sean Ellis. It's got Boyd Holbrook, who you might know from, I think, Suicide Squad. It's probably the biggest thing he's done. Okay. Uh, but it's mostly a bunch of... Uh, there's a guy, uh, Alistair Petrie, who plays a landholder who kicks a bunch of Romani off. Actually, he doesn't really kick them off. He he just... They 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 route them and kill off a bunch of the uh, the elders and um, the... As they, you know, they crucified a couple of the... the um, the 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 wandering tribe, you know, we, you don't say gypsies anymore. We, Romani, uh, that they that they that they they were trying to lay stake to this this property, and in her dying breath, the old it's like you don't mess with an old Romani woman because she's gonna curse you, <laughs> and and the curse came in the form of a werewolf like creature that came uh, that 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 manifested initially with what looked like uh like vampire teeth dentures right they, these big steel but they're like stainless steel de- it's like, right, it's like right. a poster um and it starts from the kid the, the these kids are messing around and and then the they get the kids get possessed and then they start killing each other and then they and and then it starts killing some of the other town folk, and the curse just keeps coming and keeps coming until it's like because it, all the all the landholders in the in the area contributed to try and drive these people off, and they were just passing through. Right, right, they, right, right. And, and it was the classic kind of things like they are they were innocent of any of any ill doing, and the and and the the landholder was trying to cover up that because they realized that they did they. They did evil things. Yeah, yeah. And and so the Boyd Holbrook character is an investigator checking out why these kids are dying. And then it's like you did this, and the and it's a great looking creature. There's a moment where everybody's trying to take refuge in a church, and these monsters break in and just start wrecking the house and killing killing the, everybody in the church. And um, it just seemed and 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 this is all. And then the fog rolls in, and it's just glo- it's it's gloomy, it's vicious, it's got. It's got its its effects are above its 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 punching level. So it's, I thought it was a lot of it was it was a great atmospheric movie, um, with really solid acting. Is this one is this one easy to get? Can you find it yeah. anywhere? Yeah. You okay. Can. Okay. You can, I think you can get it on Amazon. Okay. Really. And you might okay. even be able to get it. It might be on Shutter. Okay. Um, okay. But it's not it's not hard to find. Okay. Um, uh, it's mid mid. Level production. When you said great. Joseph, I was like, I was skeptical. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Joseph, but sometimes you pick things that never come out. No, I, I actually was able to see. You know, I, I, 
I didn't get a, tra- a trailer for this. I actually, I, I was able to find this online and okay. it. So okay, okay, uh, it's definitely worth the, a watch on a big screen. It's a good looking movie. The cursed or cursed? The cursed. The uh, cursed. Twenty twenty one. All right. Uh, it again, kind of a it's like it. Uh, it says here on IMDb, its original title was Ape for Silver. Which was huh. a little bit more of an interesting name. The cursed is so bland of a name. It's like yeah, you're not going to pick up on it. Yeah, it's going to get lost. Like it's going to get lost in the shuffle. I remember hearing about this on Colors of the Dark Pod towards the end of the year, and uh, Rebecca McKendry said the same thing. Like the name made people just like, oh yeah, they whatever. Come up Skip with a better title. Like, <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, right. So people people are going to miss out on a good movie because of a bad mm-hmm. title. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So don't miss out on it. You've heard it from here. Don't miss out on it. Okay, so All swinging right. back to Liz. Yeah. And I'm wrapping it up uh, with my one of my favorite projects of the past you know, couple years. And this is the HBO miniseries Sharp Objects based on hmm. the novel by Gillian Flynn. Uh, this stars Amy Adams hmm. and um, Chris Messina and Patricia Clarkson which would make you think it's Southern Gothic, but it's not. It is set in <laughs> Wind Gap, Missouri. And huh. we don't have corn. We don't have pumpkins. We are a family that uh, raises and slaughters pigs. Ooh, so uh, there's going <laughs> to be something happening in that, you know, what do they call it? Like those ponds, pig ponds. Oh, God, they're worry. so smelly. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. We have, I've, I have I've one heard that from my... like a documentary about Eating, you what? know, vegan you have a pig pond in your neighborhood. So. It's north of north of my my old childhood home, you drive, oh. you, you oh. head up towards Salem, and then you could smell it coming. Not in Portland. Yep, that's what I've heard. We, but, no, no pig, um, no pig ponds in Portland. No, for those near, of you who are wondering, but there are pig ponds near Salem, Oregon. So yeah. beware. <laughs> beware. Um, okay, so this is the story of a crime reporter, Camille Preaker, who is a drunk, and she just got out of a psychiatric hospital, and she returns home to her hometown of Wingap, Missouri because her boss from the big city of St. Louis sends her there when uh, one girl is murdered and another one is missing to cover the story. And he thinks that because her mom is like big shit in this town, her family's been there the longest, that they can not only get insight into the crimes that will get the paper, you know, like number one in circulation, but also heal that mother daughter trauma. Uh, He is so mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, (laughs) The layers of trauma as any Gothic story run very deep. Best laid plans. Yep. The best laid plans. She finds herself processing her own trauma while her mother and her mother's husband, Alan, who is just a chef's kiss of a character and their daughter, Emma, which is her uh, half-sister, is like 15 in the show, 13 in the book. They raised her age because it would have been a much more shocking to see a <laughs> 13-year-old behaving this way. And you delve into the history of the town, the murders, the mother-daughter dynamics on both sides. And it is super gothic, super good. And Amy Adams is phenomenal in it yeah. and just not like any other character she played this I mean, is an hbo she was in like it's hbo okay and it's uh i think it's only eight episodes i rewatched it while we were prepping for this oh, oh wow. okay so good okay and it has a fantastic last line and then scene goes black so Ooh. if you've read the book you'll know they they change it a tiny bit but okay. they're very true to it and it's my favorite of gillian flynn's books she also wrote gone girl which was like an international yeah. sensation. oh yeah 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 and yep. she wrote one called um dark places that had a movie made uh with charlie's theron and christina hendrix that i was going Ooh. to pick but it's not very good oh. unfortunately okay but hbo is developing a series so hopefully that will be good because that story may almost be even darker than this one. So okay, right. okay, get yourself some couch time and watch Sharp Objects. Uh, you will not regret it. Liz, here's a question: book or movie? Sharp Objects, both. Both. Okay. Book first. It's quite short. It's less than three hundred pages. Oh, okay. You'll blow oh. through it. She All right. and it's a it's a thriller, you know. So it's a pretty fast paced read. Okay. Book first. Series okay. Second. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, you are about, dear listeners, you are about to witness a <laughs> Scariest Things podcast 
first. Mike likes a vampire movie. No, uh, I'm <laughs> not going to pick. Only got two picks. I'm yeah. not going to. I'm not going to pick. I'm going to have my co-hosts pick what the last film I should pick is. Here's your choices: The Changeling from 1980 with George C. Scott, mm-hmm. or oh, the 1961 uh, film that we've kind of already sort of made mention of. Uh, a little bit here and there, uh, by way of uh, Mike Flanagan, The Innocents, uh, starring oh, the Innocence. starring yeah, De- like the Deborah Innocence. Kerr, Michael Redgrave, Jack Clayton, and Meg Jenkins. You know that because the, the Innocents is a, is, a, is I mean, that is a classic Gothic tale. Uh, the chain, the Innocents, the Innocents. Well, innocence. yeah, The Innocents is yeah, it's based on the 19, uh, 1898 novella uh, yeah, Turn of the Screw right. by yeah. uh, Henry James, and of course, it was adapted by. Uh, interestingly, uh, The Innocence was adapted, uh, the screenplay was adapted by William Ar- Archibald and some guy named Truman Capote. Truman Capote later on. Some guy. Who dat? He said, yeah, who dat? I had nothing to do with that <laughs> with that Ooh, film. All right. I was, yeah, he kind of wrote himself out of the film. But uh, yeah, for those, for those of you who have not seen The Innocence uh, and are not familiar with uh, Turn of the Screw and or have not seen... Um, uh, the the Mike Flanagan Netflix series uh, revolving around the exact same issue. Why matter? Uh, yeah, this is this is. I mean, there's probably no greater gothic like type film than this one. It's got everything that you would think it has. It's got you know ghosts, uh, a uh, a a haunted estate, and you know children that are being possessed by said ghosts it's really got kind of kind of everything um the uh, film writer anthony slide said through through the use of shadows oblique camera angles an atmospheric and an atmospheric soundtrack jack clayton has not only captured the horror of henry james story but also its deeper sadness the children's isolation from the real world the governess's problematic sexuality and the curiously pitiful nature of the former governess Ms. Jessel. It's got all those things, and it is, um, you know, I will say uh, in total, if I haven't already uh, given this away, not a huge fan of of <laughs> gothic horror films because they are a little dry, they are a little boring, they are a little convoluted, and they involve way too much, too, too much exposition. This one uh, and this version of it, the 1961 version of this story, The Innocents, doesn't uh, overcomplicate the story, doesn't create... And the Henry James story, much like Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Mm -hmm. Death, it's also a very short Mm -hmm. story. Uh, Again, writers who are out there listening, uh, you don't need to write a long, convoluted book uh, to make sense. But this one also uh, is able to push forward a very simple story in a really effective way, in a really chilling way and the children uh i'm guessing the children uh from house of, or uh from bly manor uh the mike flanagan film or uh, series on netflix i'm guessing they probably went and had those kids watch the kids from the 1961 film because it's it's a straight up ripoff i mean it's a like exact duplicate of the performances that the kids in the modern version turn in but yeah it's a it's it's a really really good film uh it is interesting i think probably uh the most interesting piece of trivia about it is 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 the fact that uh you know truman capote uh sort of uh tried to (laughs) try tried to distance himself from it i'm guessing because it was a horror film i'm not not exactly sure what what the uh i'm not i'm not a uh Truman Capote completist and and uh, couldn't really tell you exactly why, but I'm guessing that's probably the reason. Uh, I will say, yeah, go go see it if you haven't, because this this one is probably a little bit more obscure of the two. I know the Changeling has made our top 100 list in the past, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's currently on there. I don't think it might. You might not be currently on there. I did it's rewatch. In our top 500. I did rewatch the Changeling, and there are two scenes. In that film, that still to this day chill me. The ball coming to, down the stairs. I love that. The yeah. ball coming down the stairs. The murder of the young boy and the seance are just yeah. wild. I think that the just best thing wild. about the changeling is its use of light and shadow. Yeah, uh, and um, 
sort of the solemnness that George C. Scott takes to the whole proceedings. I think because yeah, he's because yeah. he, he's a grieving. Uh, he he's yeah. He's, yeah, his his wife and child are killed mm-hmm. within the first thirty seconds of the yeah. film. Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. It's, so it's a, it's it's a bit of a downer of a movie, to be yeah. honest. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you have it. I didn't pick uh, the innocence. My co-hosts picked <laughs> it's, it's the a innocence. Good pick. I, I stand by <laughs> but my, you did my the work. Support. You yeah. watched. Yeah. I watched it. You yeah. guys mm-hmm. picked it. So there you go. You have to put a caveat on the website when you post this. I didn't pick this. You guys picked it. So if anybody has any. Gripes about Problems. this. Take it up with talk to not, Eric and Liz. Not Mike. Right. <laughs> so um, I'm taking a modern twist on a gothic, okay. on a gothic tale. Not and so this is uh, you know taking a broad interpretation of it. And this is a movie uh, from 2019 called The Vigil, uh, which oh, is yeah. this is a, uh, a young Jewish man who's sort of struggling with his faith and his um, and failure, and he's. He's in trying to make up for lo- some lost ground mm-hmm. uh, by doing a a, a vigil uh, called a shamira, which is a Jewish custom in which a guardian, uh, usually a relative or a close friend, spends the night in the same room with the recently deceased before a morning funeral. So it's just him and this body in a, on a stormy night in a Brooklyn uh, row home, and it's uh, it. So it, it, it features kind of it's like you don't have a castle, but you got the brownstone is, you know, stands in as a terrific kind of shadowy um, uh, location. And he spends a long, a lot of time just sort of want, you know, the, but he's been warned that there's like the, 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 the widow is upstairs and she's kind of nuts mm-hmm. and not to bother her. Um, but strange things happen through the night as he's uh, he's he's trying to, you know, he's he's also in it for the money. Right, 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 right. That, right. that, that he's, got, he's, out of, he's out of cash, um, and, and he agrees to do this last minute, and, and um, he gets more than he's anticipating. Right. right? And, and, and so it's, you know, he's, he's, doing, he's keeping watch, but then there's weird, he's hearing weird things coming from the basement, and the body's doing weird things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and at a certain point, he's, things, are, things are playing tricks on him, and then he's getting like the, 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 he's, getting, he's receiving visitors who aren't there, and just these very you know the uncanny kind of a nature where all of a sudden he's just got to gut it through right right and, right and and it's it turns out that this that this this man who he's watching over was an evil man right and mm-hmm. uh and it's it, and so he he it it's it's kind of just just make it to make it to daylight when the funeral right. and they can and he can just leave and be be rid of it but it's not going to be an easy night. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And um, you know, it's the kind of it's a dark, dark and stormy night. The power's out, and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and and things like uh, you know that that even he can't, you know, he's he's just he he's got nothing to entertain himself, and right. it's, it's sort of this this kind of a passive. I'm just going to sit here and watch the body. <laughs> and hopefully, nothing's going to happen. And then, but it is. But it is. <laughs> it was like, yeah. and and this was one that I actually that Robert really tuned me into because I think yeah, yeah, yeah. he was in, in on it first. Because again, you know the, the the title of it, it's like it, it's true to the to the story. It's you're right. holding vigil. Yeah. Um, but I think you know that that we've we've talked about. Is it a uh, is it a singular performance? In other words, is is it him and the body? Him ba- and the mostly. Bi- the body is yeah well, okay there's, all right, there's things all right. that happen with the body sure and sure there's the things that happen with the, but are there the other char- are there other like tangential it's characters mostly a one man show okay interesting and, uh, Dave Davis is the is the okay. actor's name and he was really good in it all right all he's, right he's just he's, there's a lot of nervous tension so it's it builds dread and it doesn't leave you hang because it, it it keeps on feeding these interesting things that happen and yeah, like, yeah yeah and and there's like jump scare moments. And then there's and it and it builds and builds and builds and then jump scare. Yeah, and yeah. It builds and builds and another jump scare until the point where all of a sudden then he goes, I I I have to do my duty because he the temptation for him to get out to open the door and just take off because this is just too much. Right, right. That he is he is faced with that dilemma and he and and it and he's he's finding himself stuck. Yeah. For some reasons that I don't want to spoil. Sure, but sure. He can't get out of the house. He can't he can't abandon ship and so then he is forced. To do the vigil, to try and see the that the body through the night and get get to morning, and it was, yeah, and it has it has all the kinds of trappings that you want from. A, it's got there's there's a good bit of exposition that happens when when, you know, he arrives at the house and he's told, 
Watch the body. These are the things that you can do. Yeah. These are the things that you cannot do. These are the things about the man who who died, or at least what we know of him. And then he finds out more. He's like he because he, when he's bored, he's just sort of wandering around the house and he's finding he's finding more clues about what what this guy was about. Yeah, I remember when this came out in 2019. And there was a lot of hype around it, and then it got delayed somehow, if I'm not mistaken. And then I ended up never getting around to it. So yeah, just, I will now. It's a. It is a. There's there. It, it, it feels mysterious. It's yeah, yeah, definitely yeah. spooky. It's got some good jump scares to it. And Dave Davis, uh, I we we put him up for a thingy award. Okay. Uh, back back in the day. So, all right. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. And in case you in case you were wondering, Eric, because I know you were wondering, mm-hmm. the Changeling came in and is still number seventy one on our top one hundred list. Oh. The Innocence, interestingly, is at one hundred and thirty six on our top. 500 yeah. list, mm-hmm. Liz, uh, to your chagrin, two spots in front of Kill List. Yeah, you made you guys made an epic attempt to try and get Kill List on the list. I know. And you came up short. I know, and Innocence I is... I just don't understand how it didn't end up on the list eight I, times. It's I, been on my top 25. Yeah. I know. I think... I, I think know, so there time. you go. I think what it, what it was is that we had a much bigger jury this time out, and... And people the, are dumb. The, no, just kidding. <laughs> we can blame, we can blame well, our idiot yeah. jury. I yeah. think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's fair. Take yep. that up with Mike. Not I me. think. <laughs> yeah, I think that's totally fair. Yeah. So who, who's got any, any of you guys have something to take us out with? I sure do. Uh, I have a tagline since we didn't get to talk about it all that much, uh, which was a little unfortunate because I wanted to talk about it a little bit more. You guys wanted to talk about the innocence. You, this is, talk, you this said is, it should pick the changeling if you want to do the this, changeling. This, this, is, changeling. It, yeah. this <laughs> is the tagline from the changeling. How did you die, Joseph? Did you die in this house? Why do you remain the changeling?